This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome, folks. Dr. Charles Parker here one more time, and we have a a very high-level guest today who's going to tell us something. It's going to some things about issues that bother every single one of us in our listening audience. So if you're driving to the car, plan when you get to the job that you're going to sit in the car a little bit longer because this information is absolutely imperative. So our guest today is Dr. Joe Pizzorno, and I'm going to introduce him. Joe, welcome. We're very pleased to have you on board. Well, delighted to be with you today. Thanks for the invitation. So, uh, Joe is a very interesting guy. I met him back in about 2004 in D.C. It's been a privilege to know him peripherally. We haven't had an ongoing relationship, but it's been great to catch up with him and read, you know, prepare for this meeting because he's got some really interesting things to tell us. And here's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, first of all, let me introduce him. He is the president. Now, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's Salugenesis. Right on. Well okay. done. And the chief medical director for the Village Green Apothecary. Is that the one in D.C.? It is. I'll be doggone. I was like, because I knew that I knew them, but I didn't know that. Uh, ah. I, think, I was thinking you were out in the West Coast. So Dr. Bizzorno is one of the world's leading authorities on science-based natural medicine, a term he coined in 1978 when he founded Bastyr University. Now, folks, listen to this. Bastyr University is the preeminent naturopathic training site in in the world really and it's out in seattle and and dr Pizzorno was one of the founding persons i mean he may have been the founder but it's a it's a very big deal and then he got on top of it bastier to become the first fully accredited multidisciplinary university of natural medicine and the first school of its kind to receive research funding from the national institutes of health Joe, excellent job. Fantastic. So we're Thank going you. to be talking with Joe today about his book, and it's the Toxin Solution. We're going to be talking about toxins that are polluting all of us, our bodies, and our minds. I have no idea how we're going to get done with this in about 40 <laughs> minutes, but we're going to give it a shot. So, Joe, if you take a moment to tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into it, where you are, what you're doing now, and how you came to this particular topic, please. So I've been involved in medicine now for almost half a century. And by the way, I live in Seattle. Uh, to answer that part of the question, usually yeah. first. Yeah. So I've, I've been involved in medicine a long time, as have you. And I've seen quite a dramatic change in why people are sick. So when I was an naturopathy student way back in the early 70s and involved in conventional medicine research, the primary reason people were sick was because of nutritional deficiencies, um, poor lifestyle, smoking, lack of exercise, those typical kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But then over the years, decade by decade, uh, something new has happened. And we went from the primary causes of disease being active decisions people make to now passive act actions uh, causing their disease. And by passive, I mean it doesn't matter much about what you do because if you uh, breathe air in your city, if you drink water, if you convince your grown foods, if you use standard health and beauty aids, you subject, subject yourself to a huge load of toxins. So anyway, so as I've seen more and more people apparently sick because of their toxins, I decided a couple of years ago to dive into the research and uh, look at uh, trying to figure out, well, how much do toxins increase the risk of disease? So as we talked before this conversation, I'm the editor-in-chief of Integrative Medicine, a Clinician's Journal, or IMCJ for short, and happy to say we're in PubMed. That means we're, yeah, we're a, a recognized or accredited journal. And so two years ago, I wrote an editorial where I was looking at <clears throat> people in the top 20% of exposure to a toxin, how much more disease do they have than people with the bottom 20% of exposure to a toxin? And the numbers I found were just stunning. Mm. So um, you may recall back when we were in medical school, diabetes you know, affected less than 1% of the population, and now it affects as much as 20 times as many people. I mean, huge increase in diabetes, right? Mm. 
So, so I just so the first disease I looked at was diabetes. I mean, look at all this diabetes now. <laughs> I remember my first year in practice way back in 1975, I was so excited when I finally saw a diabetic patient. It was six months before I saw a diabetic patient, okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you know what I mean. So, so I was looking at diabetes, and I was seeing, seeing things like, well, people in the top 20% of phthalate exposure compared to bottom 20% of phthalate exposure, well, they've got like a threefold increased risk of diabetes. Well, that's interesting. And where do phthalates come from? They come from healthy beauty aids. Then I looked at things like arsenic that's in water and chicken and rice and such. And it looks, turns out that people who are in the top 20% of arsenic exposure have like four times as much diabetes. So anyway, so I went through toxin by toxin and, and I was finding all these huge correlations. So then I went off to a publisher, HarperCollins, and said, hey, I'd like to write a book about this. I think this is really important. They agreed, gave me a really nice advance, and probably somewhat foolishly, I spent the whole advance on hiring two really bright bastard graduates, and I asked them to help me answer the question, what percent of each chronic disease could we say is due to specific toxins? Mm -hmm. So we've been doing that for the last two years, and what we found was just stunning. Mm-hmm. I, I, I can say that 90% of that increase in diabetes, as near as I can tell, is due to just five toxins. And we're not just exposed to five toxins, we're t- exposed to 100 toxins. So we have this huge burden of disease we're experiencing now simply because the toxins are saturated in our environment. Food, water, air, health and beauty aids, household cleaning agents, chemicals we use in the yard, we're constantly being bar- bombarded. So the phthalate, just to say that a little more clearly, because some of our folks haven't heard that word before. Okay. Uh, Joe is used to speaking to professionals who is very familiar with, uh, you know, very familiar with this conversation. But phthalates are, you know, plastic bottles, basically. I mean, that's a, that's a big one. And then arsenic, he was talking about that. So we're looking forward to hearing the rest of the top five. And we're also looking forward to hearing a little more about the practical. Here's what you found regarding other diseases. So let's start with that. What's What was the thing that sort of rolled your socks up and down when you were looking at this from a specific disease point of view? Well, there are a lot of examples. Um, I don't know your population base. Uh, do you have a lot of women who are listeners to your... Oh, to yes. your uh, yeah. You know, okay, we'll start there. Uh, and here's, here's one which is it's just so disconcerting. So we know that breast cancer has become more common now, and it's like one out of nine women will get breast cancer at this point. And uh, we also know that women who breastfeed have less breast cancer than those who don't. Now, there have been many theories that have been brought forward for that, and I'm sure there are many are valid. But here's one where I don't think anybody's paying attention, and that is uh, PCBs. So these are called polychlorinated biphenyls, and these are chemicals that are widely used in industry, and they were banned 40 years ago. But they're part of a class of chemicals called persistent organic pollutants. Now, what that means is that these chemicals were designed by you know research chemists to do two things. Number one is they're designed to have a specific physical or physiological effect. So, for example, exa- a good example of a pop. Uh, pot for short for persistent organic pollutants mm-hmm. uh, would be something like um, organochlorine pesticides. Okay, so organochlorine pesticides were designed to kill insects, but they're also designed to be difficult to break down because you don't want the sunlight to break them down. You don't want the insects to be able to digest them and break them down. You want to make them hard to break down. So they're designed to be hard to break down and have specific characteristics. So the problem is we've soon discovered that PCBs were incredibly toxic, so they were banned 40 years ago. But even though they were banned 40 years ago, they persist in the environment. And once they get into our bodies, they're very, very hard to get rid of. So we look at, you know, a common term we look at for getting rid of toxins is called half-life. And that means how long does it take for the body to get rid of one half of a toxin? So the PCBs have half-lives in human beings of 3 to 25 years. Mm. Not days, not months. We're talking about years. So once these things get into your body, they're hard to get rid of. Okay, now let's get back to breast cancer. So if you look at women who are breastfeeding, when a woman is breastfed for like about a year, whether it's one baby or multiple babies, she actually gets rid of a lot of her, her PCBs. So that decreases the risk for breast cancer. But then where do the PCBs go? They go into the babies. They go into the infants. Mm. So so many examples. I can just give you example example where the toxins not only are building up 
in our bodies, but also we are now poisoning our pregnant women, so we're now damaging the succeeding generations. So mm-hmm. I was looking at your website. I saw, I saw that you uh, pay a lot of attention to ADHD, and, and thank you, it's needed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, ADHD, when we were in medical school a long time ago, it, it, it just wasn't around. It wasn't, mm-hmm. We didn't know about this as a disease. It's brand new. Mm-hmm. So let's look at ADHD, and let's look at organophosphate pesticides. So these are pesticides that are used on things like kale, for example. And the organophosphate pesticides are very good at killing insects, and the way they do that is by poisoning their neurological system. So a group of researchers were wondering, well, is there any correlation between organophosphate levels and ADHD? So they then looked at children born to women with the top 10% of organophosphate pesticide levels in their body and compared to children born to women with the bottom 10% of organophosphate pesticides in their body and looked at things like IQ and ADHD. What they found was, and three studies have now shown this, these poor children have a seven-point drop in IQ, and one study followed these kids for seven years, they never got the IQ back. And not only that, but they also have a doubling of ADHD. Mm -hmm. So what's happening? Well, basically, it's a neurological poison. Why are we surprised that this will be damaging the neurological system, particularly of a developing fetus within her mother's womb? Yeah, why would we be surprised when it was designed to hit the neurologic system in the first place? Exactly. Oh, my exactly. gosh. That is that is unbelievable. It's just amazing to think about it. Yeah, one of the things I think about that, Joe, I'll just take a quick aside on ADHD. I think ADHD is the big wake-up call for psychiatry, period. Hmm. I mean, if we're treating human beings for thinking problems without thinking about thinking, <laughs> then we're treating – it's a fashion show. How you look is who you are. I mean, it's so limited, it's ridiculous. I'm, yes. I, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. I'm sure. <laughs> you are. <laughs> <laughs> You've said that a few times. But that's what goes on. One of the things I really like about Dr. Prezorno, folks, he is deep into what's going on, and I thank you for sharing that. So let's take it a little bit further. Well, let's mm-hmm. talk about, you talked about breast cancer. What are the implications? Do you have any other uh, implications regarding cancer in general that uh, comes to Oh, Yes. Oh yes, very much so. So, um, the, and this was this was a big surprise for me because you know while I've been looking at a lot of the research, I wasn't paying attention to arsenic, and because you know just you just don't hear about arsenic very much. I mean, you hear about people you know poisoning their spouses with arsenic, but think about arsenic as an everyday problem. Most people don't think about that. So, as I was looking at this research and looking for the correlations between various diseases and various toxins, arsenic kept popping up. Hmm. more often, more and more and more. So I dove, but dove more deeply into the issue of arsenic, and it, it was it's so serious that I actually just wrote my last editorial on IMCJ, just submitted to the publisher yesterday uh, to get out into the, into the into peer review scientific literature. So what it turns out is that if you start looking at people with the top levels of arsenic compared to people with the lowest levels of arsenic, they have more diabetes, more cardiovascular disease, more peripheral neuritis, and more cancer, particularly lung and prostate cancer. Mm. So when I saw that with prostate cancer, it turns out one of my best friends was just diagnosed with prostate cancer. Uh, and, he, and he lives a healthy lifestyle. I'm thinking, oh, wait, why did he get prostate cancer? I know he lives really healthy. So I was thinking, well, I wonder, was he exposed to arsenic? And so then I started looking at the research, and it turns out that, first off, Less than half the water supplies in the U.S. have been even tested for arsenic. And when we're looking at just the public water supplies, 10% of the public water supplies in the U.S. have arsenic levels high enough to be known to induce disease. So this is not rare, at least 10% of people in the U.S. So then I was looking at Washington State because my friend lives in Washington State. And I was looking at water supplies in Washington State. And thank you, you know, Department of Public Health, Washington State, for doing the research. And I was looking at levels of arsenic. And in general, if you look at the research, uh, arsenic in water is probably the worst source of arsenic. And arsenic that's below about 5 micrograms per liter of water is not considered toxic. Once you get up to about 10, you start seeing some toxicity potential. And when you get above that, the numbers start getting really strong. So here in Washington State, I found a bunch of water supplies. Not only did they have 10 micrograms per per liter of arsenic. A number of them had over 50 micrograms per liter of arsenic. So I was thinking, my friend, well, how could he have been gotten arsenic? And it turns out he was living downstream from a mine. 
It was a oh. copper mine. Oh my! And they're dumping and they're dumping all this stuff into the hillside. It rains and gets into the water supply. And I think he got ar- I think he got the arsenic from that mine that was upriver from him, and that's why he got the pr- prostate cancer. This is unbelievable. Now let me ask you the question because I know okay. our listeners. I mean, I'm I'm at one with them because it's coming to my mind right now. So what do we do in terms of how do we protect ourselves from this kind of thing? I mean, you tell us a little bit about water filters, a reverse osmosis. Yes. All, what's your thought about what we can do about something as, as ubiquitous as water? Yes. So th- it is indeed a, a real challenge to get arsenic out of the, out of the water supply. And uh, what I recommend first is that everybody have the water supply tested. And not just for arsenic, you have to test it for lead and mercury and cadmium as well. So, for example, if you're, in, if you're in an older house built before, say, 1977, to be exact about it, and uh, you're going to be problem, probably having some water p- some, uh, pipes in your house as well as paint and such to have lead in them. So, you need to have your water tested. The water you're actually drinking, not the water that's uh, told you by the city water supply is, is what's safe. You need to see what you're actually drinking. And once you see what you're actually drinking, then you can start making some smart decisions about how to decrease your exposure to toxins in that in that water uh, um, the simplest things are of course to drink distilled water uh, there are more sophisticated methods that can be used um, but basically if you have high arsenic in your water supply you have to have a separate source of water well that's interesting so that's that's disconcerting what you just closed with was because I was thinking about other options what you're saying you just can't do it so how about a filter a, a, a filtering apparatus like uh, one uh, does water filtering help you know, it does help to some degree. And when you're doing the filtering, you have to look at chemicals. You have to look at metals. So for our house, uh, we built our house uh, 20 years ago. We put in a, a pretty fancy water cleaning system, it, and it does two things. Number one, it has a carbon block filter. As so the carbon block filter will clear out all the uh, organic chemicals that are in the water. But then it has a kind of this electrostatic device that then also precipitates out any any metals. So we're pretty confident our water is really clean in our in our home. But you know we had to invest a fair amount of money into doing this. Mm-hmm. So people who who have a concern about that, they can indeed do something about it. Uh, but sometimes it's easier just to simply uh, drink distilled water or get a water purifier and make sure you're only drinking the health, healthy water. But we've made sure all water comes to our house is as clean as we can make it. So how do you get the water tested then, Joe? What's your recommendation uh-huh. on that one? So my, there are a number of uh, organizations you can find. And by the way, um, my website, thetoxinsolution.com, mm-hmm. uh, provides people uh, links to various laboratories that I have tested myself and think are, are, are good for people. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I have no commercial relationships with them. Mm-hmm. So one of my favorites is Doctors Data in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And the reason I'm confident with them is because as part of a corporate wellness program I was doing in Canada, we sent them a bunch of split samples. That means we got the same samples from uh, from one, one person. We got a sample from one person. We split it in half. We sent it to the lab under different names. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and we got back the same results. So oh. that's what you want to see. You want that the is, that's r- a lab. Big deal. Yeah. You want the labs to give you the right the right answers, consistent answers. Now, when you do that, so, is that hair analysis you're using, Joe, or what what do you do when you send? Now that's water yeah. analysis, right? Yeah. So they will analyze anything you want them to. Okay. That's really good. So what we were doing mainly was we were looking at uh, people's urinary levels of toxin, toxic metals, both the first morning urine, which tells your current exposure, and then we gave them a chelating agent, which then binds to metals in the body, and you collect the urine for six hours, and that then tells you body load. Now, it's not a perfect test, and it's pretty controversial, but I personally find it clinically pretty, pretty relevant. Well, uh, what's your opinion about that in contrast to hair analysis, uh, you know, that kind of thing? So, so the, the the challenge with hair analysis is that it's actually pretty useful for determining if a person has heavy metals, if there's heavy metals in the hair. Mm-hmm. The problem is many people, particularly those who have the most trouble with toxic metals, have trouble getting out through the hair. So the hair may be fine, but it's because they can't get rid of the metals. So, so I now don't don't trust it as much. Oh, so it's bound. It's bound in, in the body in other ways. Yeah, in bond other ways, or they're not unable to bind it in a way that gets it out through the hair. So then that's what the chelation, the second stage would be. So you have the first, right. and then you have the chelation phase, and then you really actually know what's going on. 
Exactly. Very interesting. That's that's so. And you mentioned doctors' data. That's a that's a very important thing. And I'm so glad you mentioned that this is available at your website because, and we're going to have that in the show notes, folks, in case you skip right. on it. So if you're driving, you don't need to worry about writing it down. We'll have it in the show notes. And right. uh, but that that is totally interesting. Now we're taking it to the next level. I mean. I would be happy to spend a little more time talking with you about any other. One of the things that occurs to me about heavy metals or metals in general is aluminum. Mm -hmm. you know, it seems to me, now I've done a little bit of hair analysis. I'm not anywhere near where you are with your experience, but mm -hmm. I've done some hair analysis because something's wrong and I'm not getting it right with whatever mm -hmm. I'm doing and I need to right. look, look a little further. And one of the things that struck me not only was uh, was was the aluminum that was present yes. in so many people. So could you tell us a little bit about what your thoughts are about aluminum and, and that whole underarm deodorant thing, <laughs> yes. also, if you don't mind? <laughs> Yes, and that's that's a really good one and a particularly frustrating one because, again, I'm trying to be as objective about this as I can. And, of course, we've all known about the assertion that uh, aluminum is uh, a cause of Alzheimer's disease. Yes. And that's not too surprising because when you do a biopsy of a, of a cadaver or the person who's had Alzheimer's disease and you look at those neurofibril channels, they're high in aluminum. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is it? The aluminum causing it or for some reason they absorb it more effectively mm -hmm. so we actually we did dive pretty deeply into the aluminum question around neurological dysfunction as a matter of fact i'm going to be lecturing uh, at the institute for functional medicine uh, june 1st in san francisco we're having our annual uh, annual meeting or not so it's, it's in la actually we're having an annual meeting and my lecture is going to be on uh, toxins and neurodegeneration so i've actually i've been looking at that data pretty closely mm. and it's all over the board I have one study that says aluminum apparently accounts for about one half of 1% of Alzheimer's disease. I got another study that says it accounts for 40% of Alzheimer's disease. Oh my gosh. So the research is just all over the board. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm, I'm not ready to tell you what I think it is, mm -hmm. but I am ready to tell you I'm looking at it. I'm trying, I'm trying to figure this one out. And I, I don't think it's going to be very easy because, like I said, the data is just so messy. But nonetheless, it's worth taking a look at. So aluminum is relevant. And, you know, so then the next so. thing is doing the whole high antiperspirant thing with the aluminum uh, is, mm -hmm. is, is, is contraindicated. It's not the right thing to do for yourself. To be honest with you, um, my, as we've looked at more and more data, my wife and I have become, well, I guess I'll be honest about it, almost paranoid. <laughs> So <laughs> I am too. So join the club. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I mean, we we look at, you know, we we look at so many toxins, some of which you just can't avoid, that we're doing everything we can to get rid of the avoidable toxins. Mm -hmm. So we went through our kitchen and we moved every plastic container, and uh, replaced them with glass. And we just discovered that Pyrex makes glass lids for containers. So we threw out plastic lids and we put glass lids. Oh. When. Um, uh, people come to our house, we have them take off their shoes. Uh, we have a very sophisticated air filter in our forced air heating system, clean up the air as much as possible. Uh, we only buy organically grown foods. And as a matter of fact, um, uh, we are growing more and more of our own food because that's one way we can be sure it, it's safe. Mm -hmm. When we do buy food from the grocery store, we try to only buy food that's in glass. If it's in plastic, as soon as we get it home, we take it out of the plastic and we put it into, into glass. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've just kind of looked at every possible way toxins come into our body that we can control and we do everything we can just to minimize it as much as we can. Well, you know, when an expert says something like that, folks, when you really look at a guy who's done his whole life, it's kind of the pinnacle of his life is getting deeply into the research, having two PhD, MDs, NDs, whatever they were, serious professional people looking at all the world literature, and we're saying, how could you not be paranoid? I mean, that's just, that, that really isn't paranoia. That's reality is what it is. And reality, you know, it's that you can't call it a, a mental disturbance if it's a if it's a real problem. <laughs> it's definitely, a that's real true. Problem. Oh my! You know, I, I'm I'm uh, now le lecturing literally all over the world, uh, and trying to talk to doctors and make them aware of how toxins have become a primary cause of disease. So when I go to other parts of the world, I look at the research for those parts of the world to see you know what's there, what what, what can we learn from them. So I've lectured in let's see what's it New Zealand, Australia, Japan. Japan, uh, Norway, England, uh, uh, in the last uh, three years. Mm 
And so every one of those countries I go to, I first look at what's what's there, what are, what toxins are there. And all of the industrialized world has the same problems, and they're all having diabetes epidemics. They're all having epidemics of uh, neurodegenerative disease. It's, it's happening everywhere. We, mm-hmm. we are poisoning ourselves, uh, and it's... It doesn't look like anybody wants to do anything different about it. Well, let me ask you another question because you, you're getting me pretty doggone excited about this because I think <laughs> about my family, my wife, my my son out in California. He works at Cedar sinai he, uh-huh. He's he's a pretty much a nut about this already, and you know he's been living under the under the tree, so to speak. You know we've been we've been practicing and thinking about right. this, and he's he's uh, advanced in certain respects more than I am because he's. He's out in he's out in California, and that, that that helps out. But let me ask you this question because I've had some other patients come up, and let me talk to you a little bit about laboratory measurement, if you will, please, because okay. I think doctors' data, what you just said about doctors' data and the water measurement is important. Um, what about that new uh, test that Great Plains has on the mm-hmm. uh, the GID or the uh, G? Uh, it's a detox test. I can't remember what it right. is. Oh. Yes. So um, actually, yes. So I'm actually quite interested in what they're doing. Um, and, and matter of fact, around myself and my wife and then um, my sister who lives in a farming community, we've run uh, their that test on all of us. And I'm in the process of analyzing the data. Mm-hmm. So on the one hand, um, I'm pretty excited because they're giving us like 150 toxins for pretty reasonable price of just under $300, which is an incredibly good price. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but there's two uh, limitations for my recommending them. Number one is I haven't done split samples on them, so I don't know how reliable they are. Yeah. And number two, a number of the toxins I'm most interested in, like phthalates and things of this nature, they're not doing number of the toxins I'm most interested in. So right now, they are the most readily available and broadest uh, group testing chemical toxins at a reasonable price. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're the best I can recommend at this point. I have them on my website, uh, but I'm not quite ready to go full full board uh, promoting them. Mm-hmm. So then, what happens with the uh, phthalates? You because that's a you've mentioned that several times, and it's a, mm-hmm. of importance to you. Do you have a specific laboratory you use for phthalates? I'm trying to get some laboratories to do that for me at a reasonable price. I just unfortunately just two days ago I had one turn me down. <laughs> so I was I'm actually trying to find a laboratory right now uh, to will work with me on a diabetes specific chemical toxin panel because I know what I want to test and I need somebody to do this as, at a reasonable price because I think that um, as you know diabetes is our most expensive disease. About one out of every seven healthcare dollars is spent on diabetes and the complications of diabetes. So that's a huge problem. Mm. So I'm hoping that showing people why diabetes is due to toxins and how a detoxification program such as I'm recommending will get those toxins out and help get rid of diseases by diabetes. I think this is the kind of thinking we need to do to solve the healthcare crisis. You are so right. Let me ask you another question. This is so interesting for me. And I know everybody that's listening is like, oh, my gosh. The next question is, what do we do about it from the other perspective? Let's say we've done some serious testing, whether it's Great Plains, Doctors Data, or one of these other laboratories that you're working with and you develop. How do we get these things out of a person's body? That would be, where does the rubber meet the road on that one, Joe? Right. So that's, of course, the key question, and that's what I do in my book. So I, they first up, in the first chapter, I, I show people how toxins are causing disease. And the second chapter, I say, now here's where they're coming from. So the first thing you got to do is stop letting them into your, your body. No point in doing a detox program if you just let the toxins keep coming in, particularly those that have half-lives that are measured in years. And they're so hard to get rid of. Now, I don't then put people in a detox program because I think jumping into a detox program when you're already pretty toxic is not such a good idea. So what I recommend to people is that we first prepare the organs of elimination. Mm-hmm. So our bodies have our gut, our liver, our kidneys. They all have major roles to play in protecting us from toxins and getting toxins out. So I take people through a, basically three two-week programs where I say we're spending two weeks clean up your gut, two weeks clean up your, your, your liver, and two weeks clean up your kidneys. Mm-hmm. Now, that kidney thing is new. Uh, I didn't worry about people's kidneys 40 years ago because it wasn't a problem. But now with all these chemical toxins and over-the-counter drugs, nostril anti- anti-inflammatory drugs, etc., people are losing their kidneys. You know, we have these dialysis centers spring up all over the place. So anyway, once we got the body's organs of elimination 
working properly, now we put people through an, an intense detoxification program. Program doing things like this may sound strange, but the first thing I recommend is you got to increase your fiber content in your diet. You might say, well, why fiber? Well, it turns out our kidneys are actually, I'm sorry, our livers are actually pretty good at getting rid of many of these toxins. Mm-hmm. Um, but the liver is expecting there to be fiber in the gut to bind to the toxins to get them out. So it turns out that the liver reabsorbs over 90% of the toxins it excretes through something called intrahepatic recirculation. So as I asked my students, why would our smart bodies waste so much metabolic energy on getting rid of a toxin and then just reabsorbing it? Mm-hmm. Well, as we evolved as a species, we we're consuming 100 to 150 grams of fiber a day. So lots of fiber in our gut to get rid of the toxins. Mm-hmm. Now the average person consumes only 15 to 20 grams of fiber a day. So there's simply not enough fiber in the gut. That, so I say yeah, get some fiber. That's a, a remarkable point. Pardon me. Get a little excited there. So now let's talk about the fiber. Now, are you a proponent of flaxseed meal? What 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 fiber what fiber do you think is the best? There? Yeah, so pretty much any fiber that will gel. I mean, if you put some fiber in a glass of water, you shake it up and let it sit for a little while, it forms a gel. Any fiber like that will do the job. So, for example, wheat fiber is not very good at doing this. I don't recommend wheat fiber, but all the other ones, uh, oat, flax. Uh, there's so many of them that are available. Uh, uh, alginate, uh, pectin, all these things will help get the to- chemical toxins out. Now, they're slow, but they will get the toxins out. The next thing I do is I put people on a program where they have mild caloric restriction because this will help start breaking down the fat cells where so much of these toxins are stored. Mm-hmm. Okay. And next, I um, have people alkalinize their bodies. So it turns out the modern lifestyle is very, very acid-forming in the body. And it turns out that acid-forming makes it harder for the body to get rid of a number of these uh, chemical toxins. So I show people how to use dietary supplements as well as diet to make their body more alkaline. Next thing I do is I recommend saunas. Because it turns out when when you're really sweating heavily in the sauna, that sweat is full of toxins. So you want to get in a sauna, not a steam bath because that recirculates it. You want to get in a sauna, sweat thoroughly, and make sure you got towels there to absorb the sweat as you get rid of those toxins. And there's, you know, there's more to it than that. I've got diet and things like that, but that's kind of the basic thesis. That's going to be so interesting. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You were going to say okay. something. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, and then the final thing is then I give people guidance on how to live a toxin-free life. And I basically say, here's what <laughs> Laura and I do. My wife, Laura, and I do. Here's what we do to keep toxins out of our body. And we think it makes a big, big difference. Well, I was thinking about, uh, it, I was being a little bit facetious when I was thinking of all these different things. So I was thinking about Tom Cruise taking care of the, the uh, uh, detox process after uh, 9-11. You know, he, he apparently sprung for a bunch of, uh, um, you know, whatever you call them, sweat boxes, you know, where basically right. we had a detox situation. And uh, for, the, for the firefighters. And they would come out and their shirts would be black because they just sweated the stuff out that they yes. had breathed in. Yes. And, and that's an excellent example. Uh, there's actually some quite fascinating research. And, and, and matter of fact, I quote it in my book where I looked at firefighters and uh, uh, police, policemen and women. Because as you know, when they're out, when they're out there raiding a, um, you know, one of these meth labs, they're exposed to a lot of really uh, neurologically toxic chemicals and may become disabled because of it and it turns out going on a detox program very similar to what i recommend in my book was very effective at getting these people back to work you know joe i'm thinking about rapid responders you know our first responders uh that this would be something that they would not be paying attention to but they would be in the rubble and all of the the toxins would be certainly enhanced a great deal in fact the guy i just uh interviewed a friend of mine who was in in all the all the major catastrophes recently from Haiti to whatever and mm. and you think about those the things that have been um, liquidated and and uh, vaporized yes. and uh, they're in there breathing the whole thing and it's yes. it's, it's pretty gets pretty graphic oh yeah it's it, it's incredibly incredibly toxic so um I, I'll add something to it as well uh, I I teach uh, one class a year or one course a year at Bastier. It's called Healing Healing Systems. And I just got done with it in winter quarter. And so I looked at the students a few weeks ago and and I said, you know, when I was sitting in your seats almost half a century ago, I kind of had to take this all on faith. I mean, because it just made sense to me. You know, you should eat real food, rich in nutrients. You should avoid toxins. You should get exercise. You should have loving relationships. These These all made sense. But I had to kind of take it on faith. 
But now, half, half a century later, there's a huge amount of research supporting it, but I also have personal experience. So I'm an avid motor, uh, motorcyclist. I'm an, also an avid um, basketball player. So I now play basketball with guys who are half my age. And the reason I play with guys who are half my age is because I notice that once people start hitting around the age of 50, uh, they start disappearing because they have not been taking care of the bodies and the bodies start to break down. But it's even more than that. Uh, in our refrigerator at home, we have a, on the side of it pictures of our family and, and friends and loved ones. And many of them are in a comparable age group as we are. And I was looking at the, at the refrigerator a couple weeks ago. I was noticing a lot of them are dead. I mean, and, and the ones who aren't dead, many of them have serious disease, like my friend with prostate cancer. And many of them, uh, they're kind of done with life. You know, just like they're they're retired and they're just sitting on their butts. So and true. yeah, whereas my wife Bilar and I, you know, we're motorcycle touring all over the world. On you know, like I was just motorcycle touring in Australia uh, two years ago, and so here I am in Australia, where you drive on the wrong side of the road, oh <laughs> riding gosh. a motorcycle, okay, <laughs> and um, with my wife on back, yeah, which is pretty heavy, and I'm just fine. But mm-hmm. so many other people, that the bodies just can't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. That is so true. And and what you said, I think, is a very important point to underline because what we are is in, a, in terms of a global consciousness, very um, uh, apprehensive about reaching any conclusions. In a way, we don't quite trust the science yet. We've seen this happen so often. And, and you're very experienced with that because you're over in functional medicine, which is known yes. for being very serious about the science and evidence as opposed to treating appearances. So what happens is you've seen the evolution of the science. I mean, the way I tell folks when I'm, when I'm doing a presentation, we're in a Galileo mind moment. And that is where Galileo, from the point of view, we have telescopes now, but we're not using them, you know? So the issue is, and then people are still thinking, Hey, the sun is rotating around Rome because (laughs) it looks like it does, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and I think if we really take a Galileo moment and say, here's the data, here's the science, let's look and see what's actually happening. Then we have a transformational moment. And he was, he was one of the founders of the modern scientific movement because he yes. got into real evidence uh, just with that little telescope. You can see it there on Wikipedia. It's just amazing. And, yes. uh, and that, that began to change the world. And I think it's amazing. I, from a, as a, psychi- a psychiatrist, I so much appreciate talking to individuals like yourself and Mark Hyman, who wrote a very, uh, very nice comment about your book uh, on Amazon. And, uh, you know, Mark is a friend of yours, obviously, but he's, he's a very no- a noted guy. He's the chairman of the Institute of Functional Medicine. And I think what's happening is the functional medicine community with the data has now more and more reached a point of, and, and you, this is what happened with Bestier and, and your efforts with Bestier. Say, hey, guys, are we going to pay attention to the science or are we going to still do belief, beliefs? You know, are we going to be irrational and just sort of, hey, it looks like this, let's take a shot at it. That is so true with mind science. Mind science is still quite antique. The good news is I was at the American Psychiatric Association a couple of years ago and mm-hmm. I was really pleased that the presentations were changing a great deal. People were talking about metabolic disease. You know, they weren't they weren't right. talking so much about you know uh, borderline personality disorder and uh, the, the subfunctions of the superego, how they talk to each other. They mm-hmm. they were they were talking about these these medical conditions are relevant to brain science. Absolutely. And so that's that's what you're telling us, and I, I'm I'm really looking forward to reading the book as I'm. I'm sure a number of our readers are thinking, we have to get three of these books because I've got a family (laughs) of three. I got one for myself and my wife. I got Mm -hmm. my son out there in California. I got my daughter up there in Maine. We just got to shoot these out because they're they're middle-aged adults, but they need to know this stuff, and they may not they may not have a chance to connect with it if they don't sit down and read the available data. That's the key point. Yeah, there's a, there's a huge amount of unnecessary suffering going on in the world today 
because people are not paying attention to the real cause why people are sick. And it's one of my frustrations when I look at all the argumentation about healthcare reform that's going on. And you know something, it doesn't matter if the Democrats are controlling it, it doesn't matter if the Republicans are controlling it, doesn't matter who pays for it, as long as they're not dealing with the underlying reason why people are really sick, they're <laughs> they're just rearranging the chairs on Titanic. You got to deal with why people are sick, and people are sick because of nutritional deficiencies, and they're sick because of environmental toxins. Only twenty percent of disease is genetics; all the rest is under our control. So it's up to us, and we can continue to be sick and continue to be dumb about this, or we can say, "Okay, now's the time. Let's fix this." What a way to close this conversation. <laughs> Rearranging the chairs on the Titanic. <laughs> yeah, pretty, I, love, I, love, I love that picture. Joe, this has been fantastic. So say once again, uh, you, you said it, but I'll just ask you to say it again. I'm going to include it in the <clears> show <throat> notes. Let's talk about where people can connect with you. I'm going to mention one thing, Joe. I'm going to make it really easy in case they don't uh, you know, remember all this. There are what we have a connection for and i'm hesitating here because it sounds a little bit like a sales pitch but it's really something that's going to help you out and help them out there okay. is a a global amazon connection with a with a link called genius D, genius g-e-n-i dot u-s <laughs> and then i put forward slash toxin <laughs> And and if you do, they can get it anywhere in the world. That's your book. Huh. That's a, a quick little <laughs> link to your book. You know. Oh, thank you. That's and so great. That, I thought I'd throw that out. But then you tell us where where people can get a hold of you, and we'll close it up. Thank you. So obviously Amazon. You just go to Amazon and put the toxin solution in, or put. Pizorno and you'll find it. Uh, however, I also recommend you consider going to my website, thetoxinsolution.com, because mm -hmm. there we also give people bennies. So if you order through us, we then give you access to a bunch of really cool tools to help you assess for yourself uh, what your toxic load is. And also we then link over to lab tests you can run. Uh, we link over to uh, products that are, are safe, as near as I can tell. And anyway, just lots of lots of little useful resources. That's fantastic. Well, I'm going to go over there. I'm going to do it tomorrow morning when I get up early. I'm going to be over there, Joe. No question about okay. it. I know hey, a lot of hey, one more. Please, go ahead. <laughs> one more thing. There's a, a, a real cool app available called Think Dirty. Okay. And I have, again, I have no commercial relationship with them. As a matter of fact, my writer who helped me write the book is the one who told me about it. And what you do is you just put us on your, uh, your, your smartphone and you take a little picture of the uh, barcode on the side of your health and beauty aids and it'll tell you how toxic they are. And I'll tell you, you're going to be surprised. <laughs> I had, uh, that one's yeah. definitely, I'll have that in the show notes. That's fantastic. Yeah. You've done it. You've, you've got it on your, you got it on your phone already. Yes, I'm, I've, we went through our whole house and, you know, we just, there's this big bag of chemicals in our garage that we're going to throw away. We're trying to figure out how to do it safely. And I tell you, they're not, gonna, they're not in our house anymore. We're not going to let them in our bodies. Well, and it's the same thing, batteries. You know, you just keep adding yeah. different things. How do you get rid of them? But thank you so much for spending some time with us. Listen, if you have any additional thoughts, you say, hey, Chuck, there's some other things I want to add to it or something's come up. Please give me a call. We'll get you on again and talk to you because this this conversation is absolutely essential, and I really appreciate you taking the time. And I know our leaders are very, they're going to feel a great sense of gratitude for you taking the time. Oh, you're very kind. Thank you for the great conversation, and I look forward to seeing you again. Me too. Hope to see you soon, buddy. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because, as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive, misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications, like those written for ADHD, are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.